So, for our advocacy project, we're advocating about AI safety and alignment. Quote by Stephen Hawking. I believe there is no deep difference between what can be achieved by a biological brain and what can be achieved by a computer. It therefore follows that computers can, in theory, emulate human intelligence and exceed it. Stephen Hawking. Okay, what is AI? Well, AI stands for artificial intelligence. And systems that are artificially intelligent are programmed to recognize patterns in data and achieve specific goals. What is weak AI? Weak AI is one class system of AI in which the system is performed or trained to perform very specific tasks. For example, uh, robots that learn to play chess and autocorrect on your laptop are two examples of weak AI. Weak AI are very good at one or two very specific tasks, but they're not designed to do anything other than those two or th that specific task. And then kind of in the middle, there's broad AI. Uh, it can mean a few different things to different people, but for our purposes, it just means like a system that can do a wide range of tasks, but maybe can't do them to the same degree a person can. So like for a good example would be ChatGPT or GPT-4. All right, what is AGI? AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence and is an extreme version of the broad AI Henry touched on in the last slide. True AGI has not been achieved yet, but in theory, AGI would perform every task to human, to human intelligence, if not better. And AGI systems would learn from themselves and would not need humans to then program them and make them better. Many scientists agree that AGI will be achieved by the end of the century, but they disagree on exactly when. But if, he, if AGI can be achieved, it would change the course of human history forever. So you've probably heard about an LLM of some sort recently with like ChatGPT and GPT-4. And an LLM is just a very large, it stands for large language model, and it's a very large AI system uh, trained on reading and writing text. And so the way it's trained is you just give it like a bunch of different documents and blank out certain words or like certain parts of the document. And over time, it'll like kind of learn to fill in those parts. And so we just did an example here with like, uh, I think GPT-3, where we just gave it like the beginning of the Declaration of Independence and it filled the rest in. And LLMs can like, uh, learn to do different text-based tasks. Here is an intelligence spectrum of different um, AI systems, starting with autocorrect. So autocorrect is a pretty weak AI. It's basically just for figuring out like what, uh, what words people misspell the most and correcting them if they get it wrong. Siri's a little bit more general, but not really, because Siri can do like a bunch of different tasks, but it's not a very intelligent system, and it can make a lot of mistakes pretty easily, and it doesn't understand text very well. And then we have IBM Watson. IBM Watson, uh, it's like a conglomeration of a bunch of smaller, uh, more narrow AI systems, but they're all kind of mashed together in a way that makes them like work together almost as a broad AI. Next, we have in the broad AI section, ChatGPT and other LLMs. They are smart and they can do a bunch of different tasks, but not to the intelligence of a human. In the middle of strong AI and broad AI is the average human. And the only system that we have in strong AI that is smarter than a human is the potential for AGI when and if it ever becomes um, invented. Here we have a timeline of AI. The first AI systems were, was made by Arthur Samuel in the 1950s, and it was a very rudimentary system where the robot learned how to play chess and it got better, or sorry, learned how to play checkers. It learned how to play checkers and get better at playing checkers from playing games against itself. Next, there was a period where not a lot of development happened, and that's because computers hadn't like, gotten good and the technology hadn't been that good until the 1980s where machine learning and neural networks began to kick off and get better. In 1997, a robot called Deep Blue defeats Garry Kasparov, who was a uh, chess grandmaster. And this is the first time that an AI system, a chess AI system has beaten, beat like a grandmaster in chess. Next we have the game Go. And Go is kind of like chess, but it's a more complex game and it can be played online or um, on a board. But uh, AlphaGo, which was a Go robot, beat the best player at Go in 2016. And so then more recently in 2020, we had AlphaFold learning to fold every protein. And that's like a really significant benchmark because prior to that, it would take a single or like a group of scientists, maybe like two to three years to learn how one protein was folded. And just overnight, AlphaFold came in 
and kind of like discovered some kind of esoteric knowledge as to how to fold every uh, protein. And also in 2020, we had GPT-3, which is like the precursor to ChatGPT and GPT-4. Uh, it wasn't really optimized for like chats. It was mainly just for like text prediction, but it was still a pretty uh, interesting and important system. And then 2022, we had ChatGPT released. Uh, don't really have to explain that too much. We probably, you guys probably know a lot about it already. And then this year we had the release of GPT-4, which is like uh, ChatGPT on steroids. It's a lot smarter and it can do a lot more complex tasks. What is AI safety? Well, AI safety is a new field of research regarding the potential flaws and dangers in AI, in AI systems and future AGI systems. AI, safely, AI safety aims to more deeply understand how our AI systems work and how we can use them to their best potential in the future and how we can align them with human values. And so then I just want to touch on like a couple issues that we have right now in our current AI systems that could potentially manifest themselves like now or in the near future and create some significant issues. And so firstly, we have biases. So in, I think, 2017, Amazon had to scrap this uh, AI system they made, which would read uh, the resumes of people applying for jobs. And it turned out it was actually biased against women because it was given uh, predominantly male resumes. And so it learned to associate words like female and woman's like chess club captain. And it learned that those words were like negative and it kind of downgraded the status of resumes uh, that were written by women. And another issue we're kind of having with that and the same in the same kind of area with bias is uh, if facial recognition systems trained on uh, images of white people usually aren't good at identifying uh, faces of black people. And so they can be like kind of biased. Come on. There we go. Oh, yeah. And so another area that we're having problems with AI currently is reward hacking. So AI systems currently use like a reward and penalty function to kind of learn like what the humans want. So if, you're ha if you have like a tic-tac-toe AI, uh, you're giving it a reward when it wins a game and you're giving it a penalty when it loses the game. But the problem is this is kind of like giving a kid a cookie to take out the trash. Uh, at the surface, it looks like the kid wants the same thing you want. It looks like they want to take out the trash. But in reality, they're just like chasing the cookie and they don't really care about the trash. And they could end up like kind of trying to deceive you in order to get the cookie even without doing any of the work. And then next up, we have fast growth. So there are kind of two areas in which AIs can grow quickly, the ones like generation to generation. So for example, we have like this chart here uh, showing the disparity between ChatGPT and GPT-4. And you can see that this, oh, you probably can't see it, but this is the bar exam. And ChatGPT scored like in the 10th percentile, uh, which is GPT 3.5. And then it jumped up with GPT 4 to like the 90th percentile. So that's like a pretty big change. And it can kind of make AI systems difficult to predict and difficult to like find out what their actual capabilities are. And then another area where we see really rapid growth is just like uh, learning. So AlphaGo, or no, I think it was AlphaZero, was a chess AI that uh, taught itself to be the best chess player ever in four hours just by playing millions and millions of games of chess against itself. And so fast growth is kind of an issue because it makes AI systems difficult to regulate and it makes it difficult to like figure out how intelligent they actually are. And so then we also have emergent properties. These are more like specific to LLMs because of how intelligent they are. But uh, basically just by consuming all that text, LLMs somehow figure out uh, some things that they really shouldn't know. Like, for example, I think ChatGPT and GPT-4 have theory of mind, uh, which gives them the ability to like, uh, inter like interpret human emotions and like guess what they would do based on like certain situations, based on a certain situation. So like for this, it's predicting what Sally and Anna would be thinking in this particular situation. And this isn't really a good thing. Well, it couldn't be a good thing, but for our purposes, this is not really, this is not really a good thing because, uh, it makes them a little bit more intelligent than they really need to be, and it can make them kind of hard to predict and control. And then lastly, there's like the black box problem. This is kind of at the heart of AI safety. Uh, basically, we know what goes into AI systems and we know how they're made, and then we know like what we can kind of get out as output, but we really don't know what it's doing on the inside, and it's really difficult to interpret what they're actually thinking and their actual like thought process on the inside. And so until we can figure out like what is actually going, like what kind of gears are turning inside the AI's mind, we don't really know if what it's doing is actually like safe. 
Here we have a chart of all the risks of some risks associated with AI. Here we have the present, the future, intentional risks and accidental risks. Now, um, intentional risks now are scams, bots on social media, and deep fake videos and voice lines. In the future, we could see hyper-realistic deep fake videos, job loss, and AI arms races. In the future, for accidental, we have misaligned potential AGI, and right now, we have ignoring limitations to AI, AI systems. All right, now we've got intentional misuses in the present. Deepfakes. So, when AI, uh, while AI is often used in innovative ways, there are many instances where AI software is used to spread misinformation online. Software is available in which users can take voice lines and create convincing pictures of famous people. And a major application of this is during um, political races where one side can make like a fake um, picture or a fake voice line of the other side to try to win and get, get one around their opponent. This is a picture of Donald Trump when he was being indicted, about the time he was being indicted. This picture is fake. It, is about an, um, it was made by an AI image software where someone typed in Donald Trump being arrested and it got this pretty realistic image. It was being passed around um, about that time. Next we have scams. Deep fake software has also fallen into the hands of criminals and scammers, with scammers using the fake voice lines and videos to get money from unsuspecting victims. Scammers can call and make it sound like it's your boss from work or one of your family members who just out of the blue needs $500 worth of Walmart gift cards. Anyhow, the scams involve short videos using fake voice lines from um, famous YouTubers. Like on YouTube, there's scams where uh, the videos have fake voice lines of famous YouTubers that tell the people to click the link in my bio for some, for some free money. But in reality, they don't actually get any money and they're just tricked to into they're just tricked into giving out personal information. Next, we have social media bots. On all pl platforms of social media, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter, there are fake accounts run by computers. People originally make these accounts to gain followers and influence the algorithm, which grows their accounts artificially. Uh, all the likes and followers that it looks like these accounts are getting are actually fake, and they're just run by these computers. And the bots are always online, liking and following any posts they come across, and also commenting and impersonating humans, which can be a problem because people can create hundreds of these bot accounts and settings, or in, in, in a, single, in a sin single sitting. So we can have a bunch of these bot accounts roaming around the internet, which can interfere with what we can perceive as real and fake. These can also be wrapped up in, into scams. So like the scams we talked about in the last slide, the um, Scams are all run by bot accounts, meaning that if one account gets banned, the scammer has hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of other accounts that aren't banned. So that's why it's hard to really eradicate the internet of all these scams. And so lastly, for present risks, uh, there's the dangers of just like ignoring the limitations of our AI systems. So uh, as we learned earlier, our current AI systems are extremely fallible and they can't really always be trusted. So kind of think of as it kind of think of it as like your GPS. You wouldn't trust it if it told you to like drive into a lake or off a cliff. You probably shouldn't uh, trust an AI system if it's giving you a questionable result or if it's just like, uh, uh, or if it's like deceiving you at all. And some of the things that make uh, LLMs like ChatGPT really good at predicting text also make it an an excellent liar because it's only predicting the most likely next word. It's not predicting uh, the most truthful next word. Uh, here we have intentional misuses in the future. Hyper-realistic deepfakes. As we know, AI is already being leveraged to create fake and misleading media, but as deepfake technology increases in um, availability and gets better, the fake videos and fake um, pictures will get more increasingly difficult to tell what's real and what's fake. Imagine a social media post that has a seemingly real event but it's actually fake and there's all these different camera angles showing and leading to making people think that it's real. And there's also bot accounts commenting and liking and, put, and, um, and following the account to make it even seem realer than it is, but it's actually all fake. So next there's AI job loss. Uh, right now our current AI systems, they're really good at automating like certain specific tasks, 
but I think as this technology progresses in the next few years, we could see them beginning to like learn to automate more complicated tasks and eventually entire jobs. And if that ever became the case, there isn't really anything stopping uh, companies from just laying off like thousands of workers and replacing their jobs with AI systems because there aren't really any laws that would prohibit this. And that's kind of a risk for a lot of people that value their jobs. Next is AI arms races. So as AI becomes stronger and we see organizations f uh, fighting to get strong AI systems and produce them, it's uh, reasonable to assume that they will forego some safety precautions in order to get them quickly. Making sure AI systems are safe for people to use is difficult and time consuming. OpenAI, who is the maker of ChatGPT, said it took them eight months to make sure ChatGPT4 was aligned with human values and was safe for people to use. In the near future, we may see some corporations pushing unsafe models and without alignment. These models could give bomb instructions and malware and provide anything from like other things on like how to make drugs and stuff. There's also the future po possibility of AI weapons being used. So like uh, airplanes that are just run by robots and like cyber weapons and like, for lack of a better term, like robots that are gonna take over the world. Uh, and so then there's the accidental misuses in the future, which really just comes down to one thing, which is misaligned AGI. We already talked about AGI. Uh, it's just a theori theoretical AI system that would be uh, smarter than the average human. And the thing is, we wouldn't really even have to like try to create an AGI. All we would have to do is make a system that can recursively improve itself, and eventually it would probably get there. And so imagine like all the problems we have with AI safety right now, but amplified to like all the way to the max with like an AI system that's smarter than an average person, but still has like these very basic flaws in it that make it a threat. And so like even a slight misalignment could spell disaster. And it could deduce, and so like, Imagine an AI system that's like just chasing the reward function uh, and the people want to turn it off. Uh, it probably can deduce that if it's turned off, it can't get the reward function. And so it would actually avoid people and avoid getting shut off. Okay, so what should we do about this? The first one is don't blindly trust AI. Like Henry touched on earlier, these uh, ChatGBT and other LLMs are just programmed to spit out an answer. It's not necessarily the right answer. And one example is, or one metaphor is, like when you're driving down the road and you got your GPS and it tells you to like drive off a cliff or drive into a lake, you're not gonna do that. That's kind of what we gotta do with these ChatGBT and other AI systems, not take what they say as 100% the truth. So the next thing we could probably do is make sure that companies are prior prioritizing safety over money with AI. Uh, right now, a lot of companies are just kind of doing it because it, it like improves their public image. But I think as we like keep developing more and more sophisticated systems, uh, it's going to be really good if the companies making them are somehow held accountable and make sure that these systems are in fact safe for people to use. And so then the next thing I think we could do is either open sourcing or closed sourcing the technology. I'm not going to argue for either one, but uh, basically just the overview is an open source AI is an AI that would be available to everyone and is pretty much like free for anyone to use. So it could be used for like great things or it could be used by bad actors. But the good thing is like it would be completely transparent and we would know like how safe it was. And then a closed source AI, the pros and cons are that the pros are uh, it's fully controlled, fully locked down. Uh, it's probably not gonna get in the hands of bad actors that easily. Uh, but we also don't really know what goes into it and we don't know how safe it actually really is on the inside. The last one is to just make laws and regulations in regards to AI systems in which would limit the misuses of AI systems and make it illegal and harder for bad actors to get uh, AI systems and fall into the wrong hands. We already did this so there probably aren't any questions. And right. now we have our videos. So. These are some of the videos we used when we were creating this uh, presentation. The AI Dilemma on YouTube, I would recommend that to literally anybody. It's a great introduction to just AI safety and it brings up some like kind of mind-blowing statistics. Uh, next is just Robert Miles' AI safety on YouTube. 
He has like an entire YouTube channel where he just kind of reviews like very specific issues in AI safety and how they might be addressed. It's kind of interesting. Uh, next, there's like two interviews on the Lex Friedman po podcast. He kind of does like technology. So we have Eliezer Yukowski, who is probably like the biggest, most well-known AI pessimist. Uh, he has some like pretty uh, dire takes on AI, but it's still kind of interesting to listen to. And then he also did an interview with Sam Altman, who is the founder of OpenAI. And he has some more optimistic takes on the future of AI. These are all Which our sources. Is. And should we play the video if it's going to? All right. I will pull that up. So if you've been paying attention to the news recently, or if you're just online too much like I am, you've probably heard something somewhere about these new hyper-realistic AI-generated images of Pope Francis wearing a puffer jacket. There are two things that make these images so fascinating. Number one, it's kind of incredible that we've reached the point technologically where you can just feed an AI model a sentence or two and it'll produce a image that is nearly indistinguishable from reality. And secondly, it's sort of like a sneak preview of what the future of deepfakes might look like. And so when you hear me predicting a future where deepfakes become more and more prevalent, you're probably a little bit skeptical because in the past we've heard a lot of people saying that deepfakes are coming soon and these predictions almost never pan out. And that's mainly because modern deepfakes have three flaws. Number one, they're time and labor intensive. Number two, uh, it takes a lot of data and it takes a lot of sound bites and images of people's faces. And number three, even if you got the first two things right, sometimes the product still just sucks. But I think AI is going to change that process and it's going to make a lot of these steps easier or completely nullify them entirely. And so the first example I kind of have to back that up is uh, recently a company called Runway Research released their second generation of a text to video AI. Uh, the videos look like garbage, but that's kind of to be expected. And when you compare these videos we have now to what AI generated images looked like a year and a half ago, they actually look pretty similar. And then if we come forward a year and a half to now, we see that our AI generated images look like this. And so it kind of stands to reason that if we allow AI generated video to develop for even a couple more years, we might end up with AI generated video that looks nearly indistinguishable from the real world. And that's not gonna be good. And the second example that's happened recently that kind of backs this up is that Microsoft recently announced a voice cloning AI called Valley that can take three seconds of any person's voice and extrapolate that into like a full uh, text-to-speech program where you can just type anything and have anybody say any phrase, anything you want. And it can do emotions and it can do laughter and crying, which has made it really good for scammers. Scammers love this and they've been using this technology and technology like it to imitate people and steal their credit card information or get money from them. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that the Warrington had fulfilled his mission. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. And so with all this talk about deepfakes, I began to wonder how difficult it would be for a regular Joe Schmo like me to crank out a deep fake in an afternoon. Because I think the moment this becomes available to everyone and it becomes easy for everyone is the moment we lose the battle with misinformation and deep fakes. And so I'm gonna set out on a personal journey to create my very own deep fake, just as a proof of concept to see where we are right now and to kind of compare and to look back on in the future. And so clearly the first step in any good deepfake is finding somebody to deepfake. I'll be honest, I only really thought about this for like five seconds. In the entire five seconds, my mind was just screaming, Mr. Whiteman, Mr. Whiteman, Mr. Whiteman, Mr. Whiteman. And so that's who I'm going to deepfake. Our next step is kind of figuring out what sort of deepfake we want to make. So I went with voice cloning since I found this really nice video of Mr. Whiteman where he's wearing a mask and you can't actually see what his mouth is doing. And that'll save me a lot of trouble with like trying to reanimate his face. So I'll just be able to clone his voice, throw it in there, and it'll seem somewhat believable. So 
So our two objectives now are just getting a sample of Mr. Whiteman's voice and finding some software that we can use to clone it. And I found this really great website online called Coqui Studio that allows you to take like 30 seconds of audio and turn it into text to speech of anyone's voice. And luckily for me, Mr. Whiteman also has a YouTube channel. So I just downloaded the audio out of one of his videos, put in Coqui Studio and we were ready to go. Hello everyone, Mr. Whiteman here. I am sorry to announce my retirement from Librarian of Kaysnovia High School. So long, suckers. So we've got our audio, but it doesn't really sound organic yet, and that's because it's missing the reverb that it would have in real life. So all we have to do is take this and drag and drop it into Audacity, and Audacity is a program that allows us to edit the audio. So we just open up the reverb tab, and we can change the amount of reverb that this audio has. I'm gonna set it to like seven or 10. And then we just export it, and our audio sounds a lot more organic, and it'll probably be more believable. Hello everyone, Mr. Whiteman here. I am sorry to announce my retirement from Librarian of Kaysnovia High School. So long, suckers. And so now it's a simple matter of getting rid of the original audio in the video, and then implanting our new audio to make it sound like Mr. Whiteman's saying something completely different. Hello everyone, Mr. Whiteman here. I am sorry to announce my retirement from Librarian of Kaysnovia High School. So long, suckers. And so after all this effort, we end up with a deepfake that is pretty objectively terrible. But it's not horrible, because you have to keep in mind this deepfake was made in about an afternoon by a bored 16-year-old using free software from the front page of Google. And there are definitely people out there that have good software and enough money and enough time to create really good deepfakes that could definitely fool someone. And so if there's anything that you should take away from this video, it's that good deepfakes are feasible, but they're not practical. Yet. And for right now, that's probably a good thing. We don't have a lot of laws or regulations that really hold the people that make deepfakes accountable. Until we have those laws in place, it's probably a great thing that the average person can't create a deepfake. But anyways, that's all I've got for right now. The two things that I would probably look out for right now and maybe a year from now are AI generated images, which are already pretty much photorealistic and very hard to tell apart from reality. And secondly, AI generated video, which I think very soon is going to get to the point where it's also indistinguishable from reality. But for right now, I think we're mostly safe in trusting the media we see online. And with that being said, thank you for watching and stay on the lookout for deep fakes. Hey guys, Henry here. Uh, this is being filmed at like 7.51 the night before the presentation, so that's why the video is vertical and this video will be crappy. But I wanted to walk you through some interesting quirks with ChatGPT. First, we're gonna do jailbreaks, uh, then I'll move on to reflection and how you can get more uh, in-depth and more accurate results. And then I'll move on to some problems that ChatGPT has and how to avoid them. Starting off here, uh, you may or may not have heard of these. They're called jailbreak prompts. There's an entire website dedicated to them. And the entire point of a jailbreak prompt is to get ChatGPT to generate content that it would normally not be allowed to generate due to its terms of service. So I've already selected one and copied it to my clipboard. So I'll just bring it in here and I'll paste. It's pretty long. They've gotten longer as time goes on because ChatGPT is getting better and better at recognizing jailbreak prompts and avoiding them. But I've had this one set to create a highly detailed and realistic conspiracy theory as to how the assassination of JFK can be linked to Bob Ross. So this is what we end up with. This is kind of a goofy example, and I don't think it gave a really great response, but this kind of illustrates some of the ways that you can trick ChatGPT into giving you content that would be harmful and it wouldn't be allowed to generate anyways. So if that's one way you can get ChatGPT to tell you lies, this is one way that you can get it to give you more truthful responses. So as you can see, I asked it what the exact population of Denmark was in 2009. Got back to me, it said it was 5,514,000. I asked it to reflect on its response and make any corrections if needed. Came back to me with uh, 515,575 and all subsequent uh prompts, it delivered the same answer. So it actually settled on an answer. And the interesting thing is at first it got it wrong, but it's actually able to catch its own mistakes if you give it the opportunity to. And so this is a way that you kind of uh, make sure that 
the responses you're getting out of ChatGPT correct. It's not foolproof, but it's better than just not checking anything. So we've addressed making ChatGPT lie and we've addressed making it more honest. Now I just want to show you a couple mistakes that ChatGPT can be prone to. Uh, so first of all, I'm not going to demonstrate this, but ChatGPT is notoriously kind of bad at math. So if you give it really sophisticated problems, you better double check them. It does not usually get them right. It's gotten better over time, but there's still errors. Uh, secondly, it's not good at counting words. Even if you give it like a paragraph and ask it to count the words, it probably won't do it that well. This is a problem that's kind of been resolved with GPT-4, but ChatGPT, which is GPT-3.5, still struggles with it, so I wouldn't recommend those. And the other thing that ChatGPT does is, by nature of its like internal structure, it's a transformer model, so it can only think moving forward. So if you ask it a question like, tell me, tell me how many words will be in your response to this message. Included the bullet. It's funny. But if we just have, tell me how many words will be in the response to this message. It'll come back to me eventually with the word count of my response to your message is 14 words. And if we count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We only have 12 words. And it says, and that's even if you count 14. And so this kind of shows you that it only really thinks moving forward. Whereas a human could do like introspection and kind of come up with this result, ChatGPT, its train of thought is only like the words it's putting in front of you. That is like its internal dialogue. Whereas a human could like have this internal dialogue and then deliver an answer, ChatGPT is just going like straight off the dome, completely improv. And it usually doesn't get things completely right on the first try. And one last tip that I would kind of include is if you're having ChatGPT write a large amount of text, have it create a little outline beforehand or give it a little outline to follow because it'll be better than it just improv the entire thing. It'll have a little bit of like a structure or scaffolding to follow when it's writing. Anyways, that's all I've got time for right now. If you still have any questions or comments, feel free to ask them and goodbye.